We're doing it live, folks. Hey, I'm here. Brian Moret here, and I'm here with my good buddy Yash Corday. And uh, hello. And we're here to mainly talk about history, sports, and well, whatever else comes out of that. So uh, this time, I'm going to give you your call to action beforehand because I made the terrible. I'd really appreciate it if you could go on iTunes right now and leave a review for this great podcast if you like it. It really helps out our uh, ratings on iTunes. It helps other people see what is great to see with this show. It's pretty much the only thing that the iTunes algorithm uses to determine its rankings. And yeah, that'd be great. All right, so I'll go right into things. So, Yash, I know you love history. Do you have a favorite time period from history? Uh, well, the time periods depend on the location. I really like medieval Europe, though. I will say that medieval Europe is pretty awesome. Oh yeah, yeah, good old uh, Charles the Hammer. Yeah, Charles Martel. Yeah, are you a fan? Uh, of, what about you? Are you a fan of the Hundred Years' War? Uh, yeah. Although it's a very uh, difficult to study war, I would say. But yeah, yeah. If we were in cal calculus, we would call it a discontinuous one. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, yeah, but, uh, for me, it's probably a World War One. I. I, I'm a bit of a nihilist with history. I just love the incompetence that was on show for like four years, especially <laughs> especially on the Western Front. Some of that was just absolutely insane. Yeah. Uh, do you like how do you like how teachers uh, teach the uh, medieval ages? Uh, well, no, not really. I I just don't like um, the American focus of teaching history. Personally, I um I find it very American centric without like giving much thought to like I don't know like uh maybe European politics or maybe just non non American uh non-american views like um like currently uh everyone like just keeps talking about vietnam like vietnam is like ingrained into everyone's head as a child and for me i just find that incredibly irritating that they just focus on this one war like yes it was an important war but there's only so much you can do with it you know as opposed to these ancient wars that no one really even talks about that are really cool and really interesting, but basically have been lost to American students because unless you're going to major in history, like no one ever talks about them, you know? And I just find that very annoying and dumb. Yeah, I understand. It, it certainly it just comes from the recency that it came with and having so many veterans that came for, out of the war. And also it's strange just because the Vietnam War was such a strange war in the grand scheme of things. It was more of a proxy war than anything. It wasn't even really between the two sides that were really meant to be staging it. It was like a fake war almost. It was Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very and, uh, and I have a bunch of problems with the Vietnam War as well. Oh, like, like what? It's no problems. Like, just like the entire fact that we got involved in the first place. <laughs> well, hey, did we have much of a choice? I mean, uh... Like, there's only, like, so much you can do. Like, after seeing that the Vietnamese fought against the French, and they fought against the Japanese, and they fought against the French again, and, like, just seeing, like, the resilience, like, any normal, sane person would have thought, like, okay, this is not working out, like, we are not going to win this war. But uh, instead, the American side just went in guns blazing, like, all gung-ho, and I just found it... Like, I, I, I just find it incredibly dumb that they would do that, you know? Yeah, I mean, I can understand the arguments for containment and, oh, you have to pre prevent the communists from uh, taking more countries. But, I mean, it, that was working for all good and well for 13 years. It wasn't like the South Vietnamese were suddenly overwhelming the rest of the country by the, by the time that we eventually launched the Tet Offensive. It was kind of strange that we felt the need to uh, prevent something like what was happening in in Korea, just having a demarcation line it seemed like that was working fine. Yeah, I mean, but at that point, it was pretty much inevitable that something was going to happen. Um, like, like I, I, I find it incredible that people are like, no, like, um, like just the fact that people think that we could have won Vietnam, like, is incredible. Oh yeah, yeah, no, like, like you have no chance. Um, the government was very like uh, 
the like the corrupt like the and South unpopular Asian like it just it nobody liked him popular. what yeah. it, it just nobody liked him within the country they were you know, like their own citizens were fighting against their own government yeah. Yeah, like like the Viet Cong was a massive problem yeah uh, like, what, what are you gonna do is tell them you know you must like your in the government we've put in place for you that is supposed to be democratically elected I mean you're not gonna be yeah. able to do that much for them. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I feel like Vietnam was a waste of 50,000 lives, honestly. Yeah, and, and plenty, a lot of resources. And plenty of money. I mean, jeez. I uh, true, true, that, too. Yeah, well, anything that can uh, continue the military-industrial complex, I guess. So, like, it's really weird that we never talk about the Korean War either. Like, for all that we got from that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, um... That was a shorter word, and that was a lot more ancient. So, like everyone who fought that is like pretty much dead at this point. Yeah, but like they even still, like they it took around forty years for them to even get a monument to them. It it was yeah, one of the most interesting in a film study perspective, just because all of the uh, press was finally getting into the wars. And you didn't really have much of that in World War Two, and like it's pretty much you know, like a lot of people talk about oh the. TV crews were able to come into the Vietnam War and really show the brevity of the conflict and just like all of the terrible things that Americans were doing, uh, showing the bombings in Cambodia that we were allegedly not supposed to be doing. But uh, w with the Korean War, there was even less restrictions, and uh, it's really pretty incredible that we don't even look at that anymore. I'm sure, it ended with nothing uh, except a bunch of hothead rulers that now we have to deal with today, but. I mean, that's what you get from an American yeah. war. I, I, don't, I strongly feel, though, that the entire Korean, like, the entire, like, problems, can, like, face with everyone is the fact that, um, like, they split the countries into communist and non-communist. Like, I feel like the UN completely screwed the world over just by doing that. Well, what choice do they have? Uh... Don't split them, like give like Vietnam to the communists. Oh, 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 Vietnam! I see. I, I thought you were talking about Korea. Uh, no, no. Yeah, no, no, Vietnam. That was not a great. I mean, decision. I mean, even Korea. Like, you could have just either made the entire country communist or like socialist. Like, I don't, I don't know why they didn't. To be honest. Well, because that's how the war ended, and so, like it was just flipping back and forth. If you remember, it was the American push all the way to the. No, no, no! Like when originally, like, like be even before the war, why was the country split into North, Korea, like North Korea and South Korea? Was it? I I, I thought it was always uh, South Korea, and then the Chinese put a. It put no, a, no, no! Puppet. It was not like that. Yeah, let me check. Uh, Korea. Uh, I don't. I don't think it was. At least, could be wrong. Yeah, I, I know for the case of the UN, that was definitely the case, but... No, because it wasn't... Actually, Korea was... Wasn't that a post, uh, post-World post War II colony of Japan? And then, like, it just came out of that, and it was really weird? Um, yeah, but, like, what I'm saying is there was a UN resolution that split Korea into two leaders. Hmm. That two leaders would have power. Yeah, that's weird. I don't know why they did that, but... I don't know, maybe it's the communist week or something, I don't know. Yeah, well, well, while we're on the topic of uh, Korea, what do, what do you think about the current situation with North Korea? Uh, I don't know, I think... <sighs> I, I don't think he's going to do anything, honestly. No, no, I don't think so either. Yeah, like, he's... he's yeah. I, I I really think it's a pretty funny, honestly. It's this situation is so similar to like what's basically what basically happened for forty years with the Cold War, and, and how quickly everyone is to forget after twenty years what the tensions were like in that, and how uh, their uh, parents uh, dealt with that. And really, I'm surprised there hasn't been more uh, outcry from uh, the older generations about oh, millennials are so weak. We we uh, grew up uh, learning in schools how to hide under our sh our, our desks to prevent uh, the nuclear holocaust. And oh, we I grew up for the Cuban Missile Crisis and wondering if Fidel Castro was going to launch the nukes in Florida. And yeah, it's not like this is a new situation for the Americans. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. But, you know, you know, dumb 
communist, dumb political decisions screwing over the world. I mean, yeah. And right now, America just happens to be that world power that's going to make be making those decisions. Not everyone can be as good as Cyrus the Great. <laughs> so, so what's your? I know, I know one of the big questions that was always asked for the NHHS uh, applications, which you and I happen to be a part of the uh, let's call it the oligarchy of. Uh, what it asks uh, what one of your favorite topics that is was discussed in a history class was. Or maybe that wasn't the exact question, but that's certainly where I twisted my application to. Uh, you, what, what, what was your favorite uh, topic that you've ever had in a history class? In a history class specifically? Yeah, not just stuff you formed on your own. Um, I think... I really liked learning about the Byzantine Empire, because I like, whenever I read history books prior to that, like I knew what they were, but like not in great detail. Um, so yeah, I, I liked learning about that. That was, that was an interesting subject. Oh yeah, the, the, the walls of, uh, Constantine are just incredible. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, like, in history books I've read, it wasn't very clear-cut to know what, like, the Byzantines were. Like, I, it wasn't until, like, I start like, started actually taking history mm -hmm. that I realized what, um... Like, the Byzantine Empire was just, like, an offshoot of the Roman Empire prior yeah. to, like, yeah, prior to that, I didn't really know, so. Yeah, I, I think the Byzantines, honestly, aren't talked about enough for their value that they provided. I mean, it was a pretty good argument that they, their, their collapse uh, from the Muslims in, like, uh, what was it, like, 15, the 1550s or something, that basically spurred the entire, uh, Northern Enlightenment in Europe, and just all of the knowledge that had been kept from Ro Roman times that had kept Europe in the supposed Dark Ages was finally released upon the world. And like, yeah, that is true. Um, but I feel, I, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I wish the Byzantine Empire hadn't collapsed. Like, oh, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, me too. Like, just to see what it would be like, like today. When the Ottomans came in, what did they do? Like, absolutely nothing. Like, they didn't do anything really for europe or like in terms of uh, bringing down the civilization themselves uh in terms of i guess um yeah like they like once once they took over constantinople and tried to get vienna they couldn't get vienna yeah you yeah, know and they eventually fell like, failed yeah and that, that was weird. It, 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 like, it, it's history has is filled with uh, situations uh, after, you know, like uh, in the current era where uh, the Muslims failed to make a big advance on Europe. And going back to the Charles Martel, that was a big opportunity. If they had moved past the Moors and the Iberian Peninsula, Europe could look so much different. You could have, you could have French Muslims. I imagine that. I mean, you know, already heard I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, a, <laughs> yeah, ethnically yeah. French. But, I don't. I don't know. It's a, it's it's a weird situation. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, hey, do you, is there? A, you know, what's the biggest thing that, you, that uh, schools uh, miss out when they're uh, discussing the Byzantine Empire that you think they should really cover? Um, I think we should focus more on like Justinian and what he did. Mm -hmm. Um, and stop making jokes about his wife, uh, Theodora. Yeah. Um, I feel Justinian did a lot, but that knowledge isn't really covered in, like, wh whatever we're taught in school. Yeah, yeah just I remember in Faust, I, I, didn't, I never really took anything away from Justinian. All I really took away was uh, him being in a role where, like, he had a domineering wife who was supposedly, like, a former prostitute or something, and she yeah, was but just... She was, she was very smart. Like, there is... Yeah, she time, was. Right? It, it, like, she's one of the strong, you know, on par with someone like uh, Chepsu in uh, Egypt. Yeah, like, uh, there was a story when, like, the city was being sacked or something. Yeah, like the, the helodrome, was it? Uh, like the circle, the circle, circular track for the horses? I don't know what was getting no. sacked. Something I'll look it up. But, yeah, and Justinian wanted to leave, basically. But his wife was like, no. Oh, yeah, we talked see. about that one, yeah. yeah oh, yeah, the Nika riots. Yeah, that's what it was. But yeah, and his wife was like, "Nah, I'm staying here." Yeah, like that's pretty brave. 
Yeah. Oh, that's very admirable. Mm. And my biggest problem with studying any of like the Greek or Roman history extended to the Byzantines, obviously, is just the the offers of the time and really the ones that were uh, paid by the government. Unfortunately, they they were very embellishing, and so like it's very difficult to get an accurate source. And like there's a lot of uh, conflict within the historian community about stuff even as simple as the whatever they're called, the bad free with the Romans, you know, like the people like Nero and Claudius. No, not Claudius. Yeah, Cal they, Caligula they and... Uh, Wait, what happened to them? There's a lot of debate about it, if they were actually that bad, or and if it was just the situations where, like, the historians were uh, really down on the economy, and they're like, oh, these crazy people are so bad at running the government that, oh, they must be having sex with horses or <laughs> I mean like that's this kind of stuff they're accusing him of because like they're saying oh Caligula is insane Nero's a megalomaniac oh and he's running around in uh, I mean like it, it just seems like a lot of it is embellishing and you know what these offers can do creating myths like the Vikings wearing uh, those awesome uh, helmets that have pretty much singly inspired uh, games like Skyrim or you know, yeah, along with a little other uh, Norse mythology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, what, yeah, what, I uh, maybe like I heard that. Um. Hold up. I heard that the entire Viking helmet thing was like actually false. Yeah, yeah, it they was. They never uh, actually did that. Yeah, and, that was like, what I was like, saying. Religious re leaders used to wear those. Yeah. And which is offers hilarious just, yeah like so where did these like like basically mainstream people don't have any idea but once again like mainstream people never have any idea of what's actually happening so can you really blame them yeah i mean that's my hope for the internet is just that if through if through it the baseline for intelligence has been risen significantly just so that because there's so much opportunities for information and any yeah, any yeah. kid can be like oh look at me i write a bunch of wikipedia articles now, yeah, that's now why a lot of people are saying, um, like, uh, what? Who was it? Christopher Columbus wasn't the first person to yeah. discover. America. Like, that's not like, that's not common that's knowledge like fifty years ago. Point. Like after like looking at um, uh, like the Viking houses in Newfoundland, like you can't debate that fact, you yeah. know. And you know, like there, there's along with uh, the Native Americans, obviously, just coming from the Siberian. Oh, yeah, that too. That too. Place. Yeah, oh, but there's also. Like this is a bit controversial within the historian community. There's some evidence that there are Chinese shipwrecks in America, and it's entirely possible that uh, the Chinese were actually the first to come over here. I mean, it's closer, or not? Not closer. What am I talking about? It's not closer, but it's yeah. possible that they made some significant advances. If you remember, mm -hmm. under like I believe it was Zan Hu during like the. The oh, yeah, 14th yeah, or 15th yeah. century and they, the ships he so, like sailed on were massive compared yeah. to like like they had they had incredible advances in technology at that point yeah. and they just who knows maybe they did get there maybe they didn't like, yeah unless mm -hmm. there's written records which I, I actually don't know if they if there are or not but yeah, yeah you can't really prove it yeah no it's I, i've even heard like the romans have gotten there the yeah i don't know about the romans because the romans were never great navally but yeah, maybe the Egyptians. I don't know. Yeah, uh, what, what's your least favorite topic that's often uh, discussed in uh, history classes? Uh, off, 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 uh, like honestly, like the fucking Vietnam War. Like, <laughs> yeah. Hate the Vietnam War at this point. Yeah. Like everyone just hammers home the Vietnam War. Really? So, I, yeah. It hasn't seen. It, was it just middle school that did that for you? No, no. Like Henry does it all the time. Like I like he does? at least with the, yeah, like at least with like getting speakers in. Like all he okay, focuses well, is on. Well, you have Vietnam. to do that. I mean, you're not going to be able to I get mean, a speaker. You can get historians that like study different time periods to come in and talk. Oh, but well, sure. Once again, my biggest problem is just like the American perspective on everything. Like, I feel like yeah, if yeah, got, I hate like, that. a European perspective. Um, it would be a lot better. Um, recently, actually, like I was watching a video series on. Otto von Bismarck and his rise Oh, to yes. Power. Oh, thank you. And, um, yeah, and I was like, wow, like, if we had learned this in history, it would have been so interesting, because all we learn about Otto von Bismarck is, like, oh, look, this guy, like, 
discovered this system called real politics. Yeah, and no, oh, old politics. grits and iron. Like, that, that, that's all you learn. Yeah, uh, but no, he was like a fire. really like, smart you guy. You don't learn about like how he tried to conquer like um, not sleep, but he basically how he, how he got Alsek and Lorraine because yeah, like, in, yeah. In, World War One, you learned that Germany has to lose Alsek and Lauren. Well, how did they get there? Um, well, Otto von Bismarck literally took Napoleon the Third hostage and yeah. basically got everything he wanted, and from that created a unified German state. Like no one under like yeah, there's I so many never understood how Prussia became the German Empire until I watched this video series. Like until like. Because whenever we think about it, we're just like, oh, yeah, look at Prussia. Yeah, and then yeah. Oh, they had a couple Germany wars. Better, like, empire, and you're just like, wait, how did this happen? Like, we don't know any history behind it, you know? Yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, we lose so many amazing stories and just, you know, like, events yeah, from history. Yeah, because the thing with people is, like, they don't really care either. They just want to get 100, so they just study whatever. Oh, yeah, that destroys like, It's a study, you know? Yeah, like, I have these you know, two people in my AP Gov class, and, and like, they, they were killing me today, because... Because, like, I mean, I get that, like, our substitute for Amato is, does a horrible job teaching the subject. But the entire de and day, they were like, oh, why are we learning? It's a it's a student takeover day. This isn't what the day's meant to be. Or they're like, oh, am I supposed to copy this stuff or this stuff? Now, copy what you want to learn. Take I mean, what at this point, I don't even copy notes in that class. Like, it's yeah, like, I mean, it's, it's just too easy. Just, but. Uh, yeah, AP Gov is pretty much. I, w I would really like to take comparative Gov, but of course. Oh, I would love to take comparative Gov too. But yeah, like I just like that's one of the things I would say. Like I hate the American perspective. Like, like we all know how the like the system works. Like we all took eighth grade econ um eighth grade uh civics and economics. Like we know what this stuff is. Like stop. Like you yeah, know, I mean, I didn't. Know. I took I, I took geography for some reason. Oh, okay. Well, for that was a crappy for, class for CCPS, like yeah. public schools, you had to take that class. So most people would already know. It. So I'm mm -hmm. like, let's learn about like other governments. Like they keep talking about like like foreign governments, like France, and I'm just like, just do a whole like stuff on it. Like I want to learn how like the Kremlin works or whatever. Oh yeah, like, yeah, oh, absolutely. I, like everyone knows how Congress works. Everyone knows that. Oh, you have. 435 delegates it's 430 no 435 in the house oh yeah in the house and then and then 100 in the senate yeah and then like everyone for DC. knows this stuff like gosh yeah and like they keep teasing it and like bringing up stuff like the bundestag and being like oh they have a 50 50 uh yeah yeah, yeah. Like, like, yeah that's interesting can we go that into that a little more we want to know how that works we don't care about this dumb two-party system that is present here. Yeah, like, they're, they're doing a crappy like, job talking about anyways. And and she keeps talking about like third parties. I'm like, no one's gonna ever vote for a third party here completely. Like I remember yesterday I had class and the whole class was just talking about third parties. I'm like, this is so useless and dumb. Like, yeah. And like what really worked me up about that lesson is how crappy of a job she talked about the problems with the American electoral system. Because, like, it all devolves from the one problem, which is the first-past-the-post voting system. She used that word once in her entire lesson and didn't mention it again. But it's the crux of any discussion around the, the, the American uh, third-party system, the two-party system, because everything devolves from that, from the yeah, first... The, no, the biggest problem is, like, the fact that the winner takes all. Like, that, that's yeah. just... The, that's the only reason why it exists. And if you, if you do a comparative guff class, you learn about the alternative vote, you learn about... Yeah, you uh, can learn about different types of government, so, you, like, you can, like, implement them maybe one day. Like, and you can be a cultured student, because, like, the yeah, biggest problem in America... Be, like, America. Like, we know, like, everything. Yeah. You know? Like, there's that... Um, like, the dirty American stereotype. The, the dirty... <laughs> I mean that that's what they call I mean yeah yeah it is but it, it's it's so obvious how America's going to fall like it's it's just following the same trends that every other superpower does and it's disgusting I mean it's it's just hubris on the finest level just American exceptionalism thinking that they're the supreme country Oh yeah like like um Mr. Henry always used to talk about like how there was that Westinghouse competition and how like seventy five percent of the entries used to be American, and now it's like less than ten. And I'm like, that's what globalization does. Like, you can't stay on top forever. 
Wait, like what there is the so Westinghouse? More people motivated than you. What what is this? Uh, there's there's a there's an engineering competition like an engineering science competition called the Westinghouse competition. Huh. And like, um, the entries used to be like seventy five percent from the U S. But now it's like less than ten. Really? I, yeah, you you didn't talk about that in my country in my class once. Oh really? Okay, he mentioned it a couple of times. Yeah, he, he was he was mostly just ribbing on Zach Ritter. <laughs> Wait, when did you have him? I had him for uh, crap. What period do I have? Ah, oh, jeez, I have no clue. Yeah, I have no clue. Like, one of the twos. Yeah, I don't know. I really like Mr. Henry's lectures, too. Like, I hate it when people are just like, oh, we hate lectures. Like, it's Yeah, funny. I love the lecturing. I... Like, I, I like Henry's lecture, and I like um, Johnson's lectures a lot. Yeah, I mean, Johnson's fantastic yeah. at lecturing. Yeah, like, but people are like, no, I hate lectures. Like, no, we want to do stuff. Like, what oh, do you want to do? They're dumb. Yeah, it's disturbing. Yeah. Uh, hmm. What? Have you heard the story about uh, Chester A. Arthur's presidency? I just know Chester A. Arthur had like massive sideburns. Yeah, because uh, yeah, he's one of the, the biggest. Uh, go, sorry about the sticking to Americanism here, but I, I promise that'll be about the end of America in this discussion. But. I find him to be one of the most fascinating political figures in all of American politics. Really? Yeah. Was and he, wasn't he part of like the stalwarts or something? Not only was he part of the stalwarts, he was the second in command for the Conkling faction. Of, not the Conkling faction, the Conkling machine, the, as in the political machine in New York. Really? Oh, I, I, and he I became know. president. That's interesting. Yes. I, I, I don't know, but like... Once again, no one talks about Chester A. Arthur. No, they don't. They just talk about a stupid Abraham Lincoln who yeah, wasn't even that that's... great of a president. And yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Like we don't uh, talk about him. We don't talk about people like Ulysses S. Grant, who I mean was a really bad president. <laughs> I mean, he was like a, a real... yeah, yeah. He was like a smoker. Not he, he was a, a like, like a rampant he wrote, alcoholic. He he wrote an like an autobiography. Yeah, have you just seen so, it? Like when he died. Like, his children would have... Because people would buy it so his wife and children would have money to live on. Yeah, because he... And then he just died. Yeah. Right out of office. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how, how few of them ended up getting assassinated. I'm just like, yeah, you know, looking... I feel like back then it would be really easy to assassinate oh, yeah. a president. And like, especially when you're a president like Andrew Jackson hosting, like, parties at the White House, or yeah, you can like, just walk no, straight Andrew in Jackson, the door. You could just, like challenge him to a duel like, yeah, yeah like he would do that <laughs> and he won a couple yeah, he probably accepted too yeah you know like there was that one guy that he like beat over the head with a cane oh wasn't that like some senator though no that was that also happened that was uh crap i just was talking about this guy the i don't know um yeah i don't know his name but i'll look it up who knows i don't know yeah uh senator that Beat someone over the head with a cane. Yeah, I was just reading a whole Wikipedia article on it. It was pretty, uh, gore it was pretty gruesome. It was like it went on for a while. Like, it oh yeah, the 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 Butler Sumner affair, where uh, yeah, Charles Sumner oh, yeah, after yeah, yeah. Beat him over the cane. yeah the stu <laughs> the stupid Southerner uh, who's uh, apparently Preston Brooks, who was his cousin, was getting a. Uh, insulted by uh <laughs> so he just comes over and beats his yeah he, like, he literally beat him over the head with a cane and like oh and, God, people are so dumb and like this is the 1850s and people f love to romanticize the past and be like no i remember the good old days where people <laughs> were civil and reasonable and not oh. and not not those days where the senators literally walked up to each other trapped the guy under a desk knocked him out unconscious paralyzed him made him blind for the rest of his life and still kept beating him over the head with a cane. Yeah, American politics is hilarious. I like. I remember Mr. Henry was telling us about this guy who was like a senator in the United States like Congress, and then once the South succeeded, he was a senator in the Confederate State Congress. Yeah. and then once they came back, he, he came was back. A senator, yeah, he in was Tennessee, a senator in the U.S. Congress again, and I'm like, what the heck? Like only in the U.S. could this be possible. Yeah, I mean it's re only it's, in the U.S. can you like say like oh yeah son of a Confederate and have it 
fucking okay. Yeah, like, it's it, like you, you think about all the other countries with civil wars and like how bloody those have ended up. Yeah, and this one was like, oh no, pardon, like everyone. Like I feel like Abe Lincoln should have been a lot more harsher in the South. I. Like, well, I, mean, I don't know. If he, like, just a purely political sense, if he had, like, the Republicans would have been in control for a much longer time. Well, no, because here's the problem with the Reconstruction, because uh, Abraham Lincoln didn't preside over any of the Reconstruction, actually. If you remember, uh, he was oh, yeah, assassinated two died, weeks yeah. before. No, no, but what I mean is, like, you know how Abe Lincoln was like, oh, yeah, as long as 10% of people say they want to be part of the Union again, it, it'll be happen. Yeah. Yeah, like, if he had made that number, like, 50 or something larger, then less people would, like, less states would have directly joined immediately. But wouldn't that be a problem? You need a... No, because then you can, like, do whatever you want in those territories. Like, I know they already declared martial law, but you can make much harsher uh, laws for them. And, like, maybe strip them of some of their rights or liberty. Not rights, but, like... Like, I don't know, there was not that much social welfare, but you could get rid of, like, everything at that point. Sure, but there's a lot of argument uh, in the story and communities that the efforts of uh, Andrew Johnson and, I, like, I haven't actually looked into that much of uh, third-party uh, historians. Andrew Johnson views. was an idiot. Who, yeah, like, yeah, but, like, the whole problem... He, he was literally a tailor. I don't know why he was the vice president. Yeah, but, like, there's arguments that, like, his harsh uh, motives for... Not motives, his harsh... Uh, Outlook on the South uh, caused a bunch of resentment that eventually boiled over with when Rutherford B. Hayes, you know, screwed every in the world over by making the corrupt deal to be president. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that it, was a very yeah. Uh, it was very, very sketchy. Dumb. But it's it, it's also interesting that it seems like almost every corrupt deal, oh, not sorry, not corrupt. Uh, every very close election in American history has had some very corrupt. Uh, background to it and it certainly makes you question something like the 2016 election because if you go through yeah. if you go through the history of it you have the 1824 election obviously with john quincy adams and andrew jackson very corrupt quincy adams does something super sketchy and he gets elected then andrew jackson basically destroys the Whigs for it then you have the 1876 election just talked about that you end reconstruction for what for more Republicans to win for 30 years until Woodrow Wilson, and then you have, uh, what is it, the 2000 election. Clearly there was something wrong there. I mean, Al Gore was winning, and there's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, like a bunch of problems. Uh, I, I feel like it's incredible that just because you lose by five points, like, like I think Bush won Florida by like a thousand votes, and because of that, like, they just lost. Oh, yeah, like, it's complete like, BS, like, like, the arguments with like, it. That is be, like, yeah, that's why you need, like, a prime minister and, like, all that. Because like, it's, like, like even if you, like, that was such a close race. Like, if we had a prime minister system like they do in Europe or, like, India or something, then, like, Hillary Clinton would be president right now, not Trump. Oh, yeah. But, no, no what we'll... She had a lot more. Yeah, but we really just, we need so badly, we need to get rid of that, the first-past-the-post system and go to, like, an STV system, just a sin single transferable vote, or any of yeah, the yeah, other yeah. alternative yeah. votes. The Electoral College gives, um, like, residents of Wyoming, like, I think, uh, like, 5,000% more voting power than the people of California. Yeah. Just because, like, the proportion from the state... Like, how many votes the, mm -hmm. the population of the state to how many votes the state gets. Yeah, and there is, there's just so many unnecessary problems. You have stuff like strategic voting. There's no reason that should yeah, like, exist. Like, basically, like, the election is decided by people in, like, maybe, like, ten states. Like, if you live in any other state, your vote really doesn't matter. Yeah, and there's no reason for that. Yeah. And which is complete BS, because it's basically making people living in Texas like, oh, wow, look, like, if we're going to vote Republican anyways, like, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. You and, know? And it, it just creates you know, stuff like gerrymandering, and, like, if nobody likes gerrymandering, why are we living yeah, with yeah. this problem? Like, yeah, it's like, have you seen some of the lines? Yes, I have. People, <laughs> like, so, like, there's, like, an insane it's like, one it's like, in North it's like Carolina. like, one street that connects, like, two districts, and I'm like, what the heck? Yeah, I'm going to look up this uh, North Carolina gerrymandering map, because I, I know they have, like, a horrible uh, one. Where it's... Uh, let me see it. 
Oh yeah, yeah. This uh, district number one and four in North Carolina. It's nuts. Uh, hold on, let me check that out. Yeah, I, I really, uh, it's a shame how much American uh, centric, uh, American eccentricism we have in our uh, history classes. We don't really deserve it. Yeah, some of these are dumb. Like, look at 12. Do you see 12? Mm hmm. <laughs> I was like, what? Like, that's not, that's just like a, like a bed twig. Mm hmm. No, who thought these were good ideas? Yeah. Like, why well, can't we just have it, like, next to each other? Like, physical geography. Yeah. Well, I know we didn't have time to go into World War One, but I think we really got a good conversation going there. Yeah, I'm man. I'm excited yeah, to yeah, continue this great sometimes. Conversation. So, yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, thanks. Uh, if, are you good for any of the next couple days? Uh, yeah, well, I'll let you know. and can definitely find another one. All right, sweet. Well, right. Uh, if you guys like the podcast, make sure to give us a review on iTunes. It helps out a lot. And, yeah, we'll see you again next time. Have a good day. All right, see you, Ryan. Yeah, bye. All right, guys, if we don't have any audacity failures or uh, any other guests skipping out, then I guess we're going to actually do this thing. So I know you all weren't uh, very pleased with the 36-minute uh, episode last week. I frankly wasn't either, but you know what happens. Things come up. Uh, schedules aren't communicated. You live with it. And you reschedule, which is what we're doing this week. So uh, basically, I just brought Miyash right back in, and we're going to continue where we left off. Uh, we just listened to the last podcast, and uh, it seems like we pretty thoroughly discussed uh, Americanism and how it's affected the world and how it's affected uh, American students trying to learn history. And now I think we're going to transition to a war that we uh, both uh, share a liking in, uh, World War One. So, uh, Yash, what's your favorite thing about World War One? Yeah, so my, my favorite thing about World War I is uh, the technological innovations such as uh, airplanes, uh, gas, uh, tanks. Um, it's all very, like, uh, modernizing. And um, uh, in terms of, like, a grand scale of things, I think World War I is um, basically the war that ended the Industrial Age and started the Modern Age. Yeah, you, you forgot about gas last time. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, gas is uh, one of the most uh, one of the most controversial issues in World War One. Actually, it's uh, very interesting. It, it's not discussed as much as uh, America using nukes on Japan, but it it has the same uh, ramifications in terms of environmental damage and, uh, frankly, uh, inhumane treatment of uh, the enemy. Uh, what do you think about its use? Do you think it was uh, justified? Uh, well, I, I don't, I don't understand the entire, uh, cast, uh, classification of, um, uh, I guess you would call it weapons, uh, like, no, in, inhumane, uh, weapons, you know, like nukes are considered inhumane. Yeah, chemical weapons, um, that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, chemical weapons are considered inhumane. So I, I, I don't really know what that means, because, like, guns are considered inhumane as well, like. Like, like, who, who, who decides what's humane and what's not, you know? The Geneva um, Convention, I believe, but... Oh, really? Is that, is it, like, regulated? Yeah, but, you know, uh, you ignore it as soon as you think you can actually win the war. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, it, it's a pretty... Um, yeah, Geneva Conve Convention. Yeah, still, I I think... No, no one really follows that. Like, if Bush comes to shove, everyone's ready to use nukes. Hey, frank, frankly, if Bush comes to shove, everyone's ready to use nukes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's my take on World War One and like the use of gas, at least. Um, I also uh, find it fascinating that they used tanks and how that changed warfare as we know it, because now. You don't have to sit in trenches. You can actually push trenches without suffering a lot of like loss of men because you have these massive tanks that'll just like t soak up bullets. Oh yeah, no, like you were. And there were a lot of plans uh, coming in uh, 2019. Dang it, I did it again. Uh, 1919. If the war continued past that uh, winter, to actually have massive tank battles on the parts of the British and the Germans, just because the tanks were finally developing. Uh, they obviously were introduced at the Battle of the Somme, and there wasn't much you could do on the Western Front just because it was so muggy, and you had to bring like 
like makeshift bridges that people would put in front of the tanks and it, it was a complete mess and you would see in the Hindenburg line them building like massive ditches something like uh, 10, 10 meters wide I believe in some and literally the tanks would just fall into them and it's ridiculous. I, I, I wonder why there wasn't more of a push to bring tanks onto the eastern front. I mean I suppose there was it was always... I mean I mean they, they won like the Battle of Tannenberg, Germany basically crushed Russia. I think that was, I think it was Tannenberg, right? Well, sure, that's one way of looking at it, but I, even after the, that's something our history class has always told us, was that after the Battle of Tannenberg, Russia was out of the war, but that wasn't exactly true, because the big problem for the Eastern Front, for the Central Powers, was that Germany didn't get involved in there over there until 1916. Sure, sure there was a Battle of Tannenberg, but that was it for the German offensive on the Eastern Front. Aside yeah, because from... like after that, they were really preoccupied with like the Red Revolution. Um, there was just a lot of stuff happening there that, like, the, the, basically, I, I, in my opinion, the Eastern Front after Tannenberg was completely like no, no one really cared. There wasn't really anything happening there, you know. Like, whatever was happening in France, like at the Battle of Somme, battle, like during this uh, when they were on the Seine River. Um, that's much more important. Well, told that to Conrad von Hotzeldorf. Austria Hungary was having its empire ravaged by offensive. Yeah, like... well, it's it's Austria Hungary. Like, oh, okay. Like, I... Honestly, uh, like I, like just the fact that Austria Hungary was a like the reason Austria Hungary existed was um, I feel like Germany because what Otto von Bismarck basically did was he wanted this buffer state between like Russia and Germany. Yeah. Um, like the southern, like all, like you know how the Balkans was like always a very difficult to rule area. Yep. He just wanted a buffer between Germany and that, so that's why Austria Hungary existed. Like, let's be honest. Like, if Otto von Bismarck had wanted um, Austria Hungary part of like Germany, like he could have done it very easily, but he just wanted a buffer state. Oh, absolutely. So, you, you see so, so many uh, grand military leaders uh, have their empires fall apart just because they overextended themselves. Just, yeah, aka Napoleon. Yeah. Totally Napoleon. Napoleon. And, it, and it always happens in Russia. Like, I don't understand. Like, whenever, like, like Russia loses, like, all the wars, except when it, like, matters the most. Like, <laughs> yeah. when someone, like, pushes into Moscow, that's when Russia wins. Like, it's hilarious. Like, Napoleon pushed too far into Russia, lost. Hitler pushed too far into Russia, lost. But when it comes to stuff like the Russo-Japanese War, Russia got demolished by the Japanese. Like they stood no chance. Oh yeah. Um. Yeah. So like, I I don't really like Russia. Like honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's just like luck or what. But Russia just manages to win the wars that count. But loses everything else. Like in like um they lost that war in Afghanistan that basically spelled the demise of the Russian Empire, the USSR. Yeah, that's that's one way of looking at it. I mean the, the Russian people always had a really strong resolve even with the wars that they were losing. It was just they didn't have any industrialization in the country and really it just took a terrible person to uh, push the country to the point that it could actually harness its massive uh, population resources and you really saw that in World War Two, them being able to stand alone in the world, really, and save it from, uh, well, Hitler. Oh, uh, definitely. Like, if they had lost, if Russia had lost, um, uh, I, I feel like Operation Sea Line definitely would have happened, and Britain would have fallen, and then from there on, like, Germany had nukes. Maybe if the U.S. had gotten nukes in time, it would have been, like, uh, mutually assured de destruction, so they wouldn't have, like, done anything. But if Germany had gotten nukes first, like, it would have completely changed the story. Like, we would have probably be living in some, like, man-in-the-high-castle situation now. Yeah. You know? I, I couldn't see a scenario where uh, Germany ended up getting nukes first. The whole thing was they had scientists at the time, but they just said, we don't need the nukes. We're already doing so well militarily. But yeah, the, yeah. But the real significance behind Stalingrad was that Germany was getting very close to Azerbaijan it, either Azerbaijan or Tajikistan, and Tajikistan or Azerbaijan, they had a ton of resources. Yeah, and like Germany, well, Germany was only a couple mile, miles out, and if they made it there, they would have had an incredible foothold in Asia, and it would have been a disaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. 
because at that point they were like running out of resources in Europe. Oh yeah. I I find it hilarious. I people always talking about Stalingrad. I always like um thinking about El Alamein. Like if Germany had gotten Europe, they would have probably pushed into Middle East, and then there's massive oil reserves there. You know. Well, how much did they know about but, it? About yeah, that yeah, at I, the time? I don't exactly know when they discovered the oil reserves there, but yeah, that still would have been something. You know, oh, sure. uh, cutting 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 off the Suez Canal. Um, Britain wouldn't be able to like fund its colonies in India. India probably would have fallen. Oh, okay. They knew. Japanese, maybe. Mm, they knew about oil at the time. Uh, I just looked it up in Saudi Arabia. Uh, apparently, discovered it in 1938. Oh, so yeah, that Germany definitely had some idea. Hmm, that's that's very interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. So El Alamein and Stalingrad basically saved everything. Uh, do you ever think though that if Germany had not attacked Russia and just continued um, attacking Britain and like you know what Operation Sea Line is, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. Yeah. If they had like actually done that, do you think um, we'd be looking at a different like altered world history? Like, do you think A, they'd be successful, and B, if they were, how how do you think the rest of the war would have played out? Uh, well, I I think the biggest contingency when you're uh, when you discuss that is what would the U.S. have been more willing to put up with uh, Russia or Germany at the time? Because there's there's a pretty good case that the U.S. decided on Germany by uh, leaving Russia alone for two years in the wilderness against. Germany, and like they left Russia to die, and so 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 you're saying Brit, uh, Britain would have fallen? Yeah, yeah, Britain definitely would have fallen. I don't think America would have fallen. I think they probably would have made big pushes into the German Empire, but I don't think by any means they could have beaten them alone. Yeah. Um. So so, what do you, what do you think? Like, um, the biggest thing that could have changed in World War Two that would have um altered, like the war significantly because in my opinion i feel like if um the japanese had attacked like vladivostok and just pushed russia's um uh i guess what is that western no eastern border um instead of going for pearl harbor i feel like uh they would have won like the axis powers would have won Hmm. if they had not attacked pearl harbor yeah, that's a really interesting outlook. I, I've, I've never thought of that, honestly. If Japan just you know, did the same thing that they did to China and just ran straight through Siberia. Yeah, I, like, and there's that. a lot of resources there. They, they could have done it. Like Honestly, I feel like the biggest, like, the stupidest decision that happened wasn't even Hitler's fault. Like I, I don't I don't think Hitler lost World War, um, World War II. No, I, not at all. I think, that, I think uh, Hideki Tojo definitely lost it for the Axis powers. Well, I mean, there, there's an interesting conspiracy around uh, Pearl Harbor, actually, that the U.S. knew about it the entire time and that they let it go on so that the, the country would have a justified reason to get into the war. But that, that, that would contradict with the theory that the U.S. was trying to starve out Russia. Because why would the U.S. want to get into a war that it was making money off of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, they were, like, loaning mass. Like, the Britain wasn't massively in debt. Like, they were making a lot of money by doing the Lend-Lease, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Trying to s- Yeah, it seems like the Japanese plan to attack Russia was just was always a what if and never really something they considered. Yeah, they they definitely should have done that. I feel like if they had, we'd be in a different world right now. Mhm. Hmm. That, that, that's a really good what if. I I do you do you enjoy World War 2 or World War 1 more? Um World War Two, because there's more like uh, history behind it. Um, World War One compared to World War Two is very boring, just to think about, in my opinion, at least. Like, why, do you, why do you think that is? Uh, I think World War One is dominated by trench warfare, while World War Two is blitzkrieg, and that's just more fascinating to me. Yeah, personally, like mm. uh, they were just like in France, Germany was just sitting in trenches. Both sides were just sitting in trenches. Um, yeah. We, so, we have to. Yeah. You have to remember that World War, everyone always just thinks of the Western Front in regards to World War One. But there, there were ten fronts in World War One. Like yeah, were, yeah. There were. I mean, there were a lot of fronts, and but but each front was more exciting, in my opinion, because um, during World War Two, I think Germany actually fought like one of the most northernmost battles ever. It was like northern Norway or something like that. 
like that's interesting like you're fighting like in like such a north place with all this cold stuff and you're still fighting like i i find battles that happen in extremities like very fascinating so that's what that's like the nordic front was something um uh they actually were attacking britain's outpost in like i think it was the falklands um germany was attacking britain forces um i i even heard that germany had like u u boats stationed off the coast of america um yeah they i that, that's what i heard as well and there was a lot of literature going around during that time period about the american fear about getting attacked and it, it, it's very similar to the atmosphere that was going on during the cold war actually but I, I don't what I what I don't like about World War Two is it feels too easy to like it. It seems and, and like it's very easy to romanticize it, but I, I'm not a big fan of uh, romanticizing things. I, I I like the gritty war where it everyone is at fault and like you're not really sure who who really came out of it on the right side and ultimately just it becomes not. It, it, I mean it's a very nihilistic war really. And it, it, it contrasts a lot with all these other wars where you say, oh, we have the good guys, oh, we have the bad guys. But you, you, you can't create good guys and bad guys in the World War One. They're all bad guys, and they're all killing people, and for it, you have what... Well, really, you have World War Two to thank for it, but... Yeah, and I think World War Two killed, like, 60 million people. I think that was, like, 30 of the world population. Seems a bit high. Uh, let me see... Uh, no, that's uh, yeah. It seems pretty realistic. That's crazy. Wow, only four hundred thousand for the U.S. That is nuts. Yeah. Because in the USSR had twenty four million. That's unbelievable. Oh no, yeah. it, it was only like oh okay. Well, if you want to include civilians, it was forty five million, but. Oh, you know, and that's still a lot of people. I mean, yeah, but... Whew, wow, that's a lot of people that died in the Philippines. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, the, the Japanese were conquering. Yeah, yeah so. they were just slaughtering, apparently. Wow. Yeah. Oh, uh, hmm. Are, are you a big fan of the Napoleonic Wars? Um, out of what I know about them, yeah. But once again, I, I like like I, I I no one really teaches like uh, European wars, you know. Yeah, I I I was really excited when I was uh, looking for the AP catalog and I saw European history. I'm like, oh, finally! And then it turns out that's the one AP class we don't have. Yeah, <laughs> I would love taking that. I don't have room though. No, not at all. And if I can't take AP uh, Physics C, which I'm very happy that I couldn't, but if I can't take that, no way I could get in European history. Yeah. I couldn't even get in world history. Wait, were you trying to take... AP World? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, I... were you trying to take AP Physics? Uh, no. Like, I had a whole list of classes I would be taking if I had more room in my schedule. But the problem is oh. you only get so many classes, and even it, and though I took online PE, you, you still just have so many classes that you have to take, and unfortunately Spanish eats up way too many of them. So I, I think I'm going to transition us out of history right now because I, I don't think we have much left to say on that. So yeah, I'm, cu I'm curious to see what what you think about uh, if coding should be a, considered a foreign language credit. Uh, yeah. Well, it depends on the language, but yeah, I feel because um, it, it, it it's not typical language. The syntax is very different to anything I've ever. Um, learned, you know. Yeah, absolutely. But you got to think that it, the real purpose of learning a foreign language in the typical sense is just to be exposed to a new way of uh, understanding under, understanding culture, or uh, being exposed to new ideas, or uh, understanding a new way of communicating. And you know, really, uh, coding does a very good job of that. It, I mean, even the culture that you get from uh, someone like Brian Tonk. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, just so you guys know, Brian Tong is uh, the host of uh, CNET, which is a 
a, a video series that, for some reason, our teacher uh, is very fond of showing every class. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, what do you think is the biggest problem in schools right now? Um, I would say uh, teaching like uh, math and physics. Like uh, I, I know you, but uh, um, like we just have an awful physics teacher at Clover Hill, and uh, I didn't really learn anything in this class, to be honest. Um, Brian, what do you, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I, I think the biggest problem with him is he, he he wants to teach to the people that already understand physics, but he doesn't want to teach the, to the people that don't have a good understanding. Like, anyone who knows the concepts he's talking about, they can get a great appreciation of the of physics from him, but anyone who doesn't have that, a background and is just trying to learn the basics and not scrape by, but just build upon nothing, it's very difficult, and I think there's a big problem with it in that... In elementary school, we're never exposed to physics. With biology and chemistry, we're only exposed in like an 8th grade science class, maybe, or a 7th grade science class. We get some experience with the subject matter, so we have some kind of background. But for some reason with physics, we're just thrown into it in the middle of high school when really it's too late to be exposing us to a brand new subject, and it becomes a problem because the teachers aren't prepared to completely introduce a brand new thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, I think, uh, well, for me personally, I had really good math teachers in high school, thankfully. But um, in middle school, I had awful math teachers. Like, um, I, I don't like to blame other people for maybe like my failures, but I feel like if I had a better math teacher in seventh grade, um, my life would be like re not really different, but somewhat different because um, if he was a good teacher, I could have taken algebra two in um, eighth grade and then uh, taken trig ninth grade and then gone directly into BC in tenth grade and then taken uh, differential equations. 11th grade. Yeah, before um, they stole it from you? Yeah, before they got rid of it, which I'm still really salty about, and yeah, I, I get mad about that a lot. But, um, yeah, that's that's just life, I guess. Like, it really sucks, but, you know. Yeah, it's so important for young people to have good teachers. It's very easy to have a bored teacher that's either on their last year before they retired, or they're just not really happy with their job and, and that that kind of atmosphere and uh, that kind of perception of the subject uh, just is transferred to the students and really uh, you're learning about the subject through the lens of the teacher and when the teacher doesn't care about what they're talking about that's just that's just teaching people not to care about it and i think that, i think there's a good case to be made that the i, I don't know how do you feel about the issue of uh, if you should uh, help the people below at the expense of the people on top, or if you should uh, raise... Oh, it's awful. Yeah, like, sh should you be trying to raise the people on top even no, higher at the expense? Not, not, not a, yes, you should. You should raise the top people. Because the top people are the ones who bring up the bottom people. Like, like I, I don't believe in trickle-down economics at all, but I believe that I don't believe small business. Like I don't. I don't exactly know. I'm not an economics major or anything. I don't really know the official stuff. But I, I feel like big business is a lot more important to an economy than small business. Because like think about Walmart. Like how many people does Walmart hire? You know, yeah, like, it's a, much more substantial. Yeah, that's and, a good point. The the biggest and, problem with big business though is they don't pay taxes. Oh, true. Like, uh, like if you want to get on that discussion, that's like a completely separate topic. Oh but yeah. But basically, um, my problem is, uh, I guess, I guess, the people who are at the bottom, like academically, like the people who people like with the stupid no no child left behind thing, um, basically. I find great issue in that because the kids who are in those programs, 
they aren't really um super motivated yeah motivated to learn and that's just like i, I feel like you're wasting money yeah, there, there's a lot of wasting money going on in government right now, and it's unfortunate. But I mean, it seems like a a, a lot of the economic theory just doesn't know what to do, except for just throw money at problems. I mean, doing something like trickle down economics, as you said, is obviously not going to work. It makes very little sense. Rich people don't spend money; they hoard it. That's mm -hmm. just how it works. But yeah. throwing money at problems also doesn't work. So there's a big question of how how do you fix a system if it's if it's broken? If the system doesn't want to be fixed, I guess. Yeah. Do Do you think that capitalism works in the in the 21st century, at least in the American uh, idea? Uh, I believe it does. Um, Do yeah. You, do you think that uh, what country do you think is the best economic model that uh, the rest of the world should be uh, looking into? Uh, probably like I feel like uh, the most capitalistic countries are actually the best. Like uh, I would say maybe like Singapore, Hong Kong. Like I like honestly, in my opinion, I don't know how, but Singapore and Hong Kong are more like American than America is. You know, well, sure. just their just their personal freedoms that they possess, and they and they've had less time to have the uh, American idea perverted. They've only been around for seventy or so years, and only like I, I want to say like fifty years have they been free of the uh, Chinese influence. Yeah, like, I mean, and they're still they're, under it, but you know. Yeah, but I mean, like, like they just have like more like unrestricted stuff than even the u.s does you know oh yeah i would love to visit that, that at some point but oh yeah. wow really uh sovereignty yeah. over uh, macau was transferred back to china in uh, in I mean, 1999 no one, no, no one really cares about macau macau is like a gambling place you know hmm. yeah it makes a lot of money yeah um yeah hong kong definitely good economic model um i like that um, and nope, uh, Hong Kong's under China as well now, 1997 oh yeah, 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 but, but they still have some autonomous um, stuff, like they, like they have like a I think it's called what is it called, there's like a term, special economic kind of, zone huh, special economic zone no, there's like what is their president called it's like do, the executive do they have a president Oh, a special administrative region. Oh, he's supporting to uh, Wikipedia. Chief, chief, chief executive, that's what it's called. Okay. And they're basically head of the government. Hmm. And, um, yeah, so I, I, I just... Well, if the 20th century has taught me anything, it's to not trust China. If they're saying that they're going to keep their hands off the country... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, by, by 2099... That's gonna be gone in Hong Kong. But I feel like China, like I, China, like taxes Hong Kong. They'll make a lot of money because China is, like, really like, like they're probably making a lot of money off, uh, sh uh, Hong Kong right now. And even if it's not like that, I feel like a country like Singapore could be a good example. The problem with Singapore, and like a lot of countries where they have good economic models, is they're very small countries that have, um, like, not a lot of, like, people, you know? Like, like whenever people talk about gun control, they're like, oh, yeah, like, we should, like, in, in Switzerland, they, like, everyone owns a gun and they're so safe. Well, people don't understand that in Switzerland, in order to get a gun, like, you need to be, like, trained and that I think um, you have to serve in the military of Switzerland. I feel like they have the draft and everyone there is really well educated on gun safety and it's not like here where you can just go out to like some gun store and buy a gun like that like just just that in general is really scary to me like i was at chipotle today actually and there was just a guy there sitting with a gun like what if someone just comes up and he, like like knocks that guy out takes the gun out and starts shooting you know yeah i mean you're screwed yeah, like, like, and, and it's really dumb. Like, I knew this, like, really, like, dumb guy 
who got fired from Dick's because he left like the gun storage area open, like unlocked for like oh, two God. hours. Like if someone had wanted, they could have just walked in, taken a gun, and left, and no one would have known. Like, um, I, I like I, I like I understand the Second Amendment, and no offense to I guess the writers of the Constitution for that. That Second Amendment is complete bullshit. Like, they lived in very different times when, um, yeah, hunting was actually, like, a way to get food. Now, now no one hunts for food. Like, I, like, <laughs> I, I really doubt anyone in the U.S. hunts for food now. Yeah, and I don't even know, if, I don't even know if it had to do necessarily with, uh, yeah, being able to hunt for food. I think it, no, yeah, it was... I think, I think it was, like, in, in order some nation invades us, we need protection. Yeah, just because well, it's, it's so the different. USA. Like we have so many nukes. Like no nation, no one nation can successfully invade us. You know, especially so at I this feel, point. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like even like if uh, like a collection of I feel like the only way we will ever lose the United States is if like like Russia, India, and China all like just decide one day like, hey, let's team up against the United States. Like that's the only way the United States will ever lose. Yeah, and why bother? Okay. Yeah. You can just wait for another economic collapse. It's bound to happen. The U.S. economic collapse? Yeah. Oh, I don't think the U.S. is going to collapse for a while now. We just went through a recession. Oh, really? I feel like, Chi- like China is going to collapse sometime soon. China's hmm. Earth rate is already declining. Well, you know, in, uh, in AP U.S. history, one of the biggest topics we always discussed is the 20-year cycle for American economics and the uh, recession and boom periods. And, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I think it's very clear that right now we're definitely in a boom period. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what's going to happen in five years? Yeah, who knows? I, I don't know. Um, Not that I claim to, but, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, like, it's just, I feel like China hit their boom. And now there's nothing left for them. Like, with the entire one-child policy, like, now they don't have, like, a workforce that's good enough, you know? Well, the big um, thing with the one-child policy that most people get wrong is there's a, in like, 70% of the country is exempt from that. So it doesn't actually have that big of an effect, but sure. I mean, I know you can have a second child, but you just have to pay a fee or something like that. Yeah. Well, you used to. Now they got rid of it, so... Um. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Now, now we've I, got to worry about India over reproducing. <laughs> I, I actually read once, uh, I think Mumbai is going to be the most populous city by 2050, having, I think it was 80 million people. Hmm. And, um, hold on, let me find that article. Yeah, and in the meantime, I think it's a very interesting discussion what a city even is, because a lot of the debates surrounding... Uh, the most populous cities in the world hinge upon how much of suburbs do you want to include, how much is of it is the surrounding uh, megalopoly, or something like Tokyo, which you also include surrounding cities that just happen to be close to it. Like, uh, oh, what is the big example? Uh, I'm not really sure, but yeah, I, I've seen some diagrams that just you know, throw in an entire Kanto region. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, I think... What, what, oh, yeah, I was, th- I was thinking about, like, the... Um, I think it's the, you know, Kobe, Kabe, I don't know how to say it, um, in Japan. Yeah. Um, let me say that. Oh, yeah. Ka- Kabe? I don't know how to say the city. But basically, it's, uh, it's like a mega city that's also next to, like, this city called Osaka mm-hmm. in Kyoto. And so, it's like, I think they, like, merged the city into, like, one like, super massive thing. Like, I don't know what it's called. Like, oh, I think it's, like, a mega city. I don't know what it's like, the official. Yeah, I'm sure it's called something different in uh, Japan, but aside from the fact that they speak a different language, but... Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's, like... I think they were planning to do something like that um, from, like, New York to D.C. They were going to, like... Yeah, I, I saw that, actually. That was That was very weird. I wonder if that could have worked, because like the problem with it is there's a lot of uh, rundown areas in between. Oh, uh, it's called a megalopolis. Yeah, yeah. But hey, the problem with the whole idea of a megalopolis on the east coast is there's a 
it's a massive area. Like if you just look at Japan overlaid onto the U.S. East Coast, the the areas are not really comparable. And uh, there's a lot of rundown areas in between uh, Washington D.C. and New York. I mean, if you just want to look at some areas of Pennsylvania, they're very uh, back roads still. And well, you're gonna go for all of New Jersey, and we know what what kind of a cluster or heck that could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, still. Um, what was I saying? Hold up. I I still feel like it, in the future it could be developed. Um, one day, I hope to live in a world like. Uh, do you, you do you follow Star Wars? Oh, oh yeah, I'm a massive Star uh, Wars fan. You know, you know the city uh, Coruscant. I think the planet. The what? <laughs> yeah, you mean Coruscant? Coruscant. I don't know. Are you a Star Wars fan? <laughs> no, I just like the like the background. Yeah. Oh, um, anyway, Coruscant. Apparently, one trillion people live on that. Like, that's how, like, big that city is. Like, there are, like, multiple layers. And at the bottom, like, the bottom layers is, like, where all the trash goes. And, like, even the police don't go at the bottom layers because of how dangerous it is. Oh, yeah. And then, like, all the elite people live at the top, like, near the sunrise. And uh, they need to get, like, these, like, freighters to come and, like, deliver, like, food and water. Because the entire city, like, the entire planet is a city, you know? Yep. Like, uh, like, yeah, you can have vertical farming, but I don't think that will be uh, that much good when there's a trillion people to feed, you know? Yeah, and mostly it seems like just uh, space colonialization is what really helps them out. You just turn a bunch of planets into slave planets and, and tr pretend yeah. to forget about them. And... Yeah, I mean... Um... Yeah, I just really like lore of, like, like these things about space age nations. Like, um, basically, I was thinking about, uh, there's a video game called Titanfall, in which, basically, there's a, I, I don't know what they're called, but there's, like, an interna international organization, and they colonize some other planet, and then there's some war happening on Earth, so they leave, and the colonists, like, make their own colony, and they're, like, completely separate from whatever happening, whatever is happening on Earth earth and then the international people come back and they're like oh yeah you guys are all our property like we uh, made all these like we gave you life here so we're gonna take this all back and they're like the col colonists co colonists are like no basically like it's what happened between great britain and the colonies in the 17th century except it's like inter interstellar you know yeah. intergalactic like, I find that amazingly fascinating. Like, I was actually thinking about it. I'm like, man, like, if, if like, a country, like, starts colonizing Mars, provides people there, like, people to there, like, eventually, they're going to have to start making their own country. Like, eventually, there will be a country on Mars, you know? And, like, 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 I, I just, I, I'm just curious on how that would affect, like, Earth politics, you know? Because you have something over happening over here, like would they be part of the UN? What like is like is it a nation state? Like what do you call it? You know, like what would you like what would you classify? Like like I'm just curious on how it would like the economic system would work, how the politics it would work. Um, if if it is like an offshoot, if if like the US like claims a state on Mars. Like, would they have, like, equal congressional congressional sits, like, say? Will they send, like, senators? And since it is a space colony, will, like, Congress move to space so they can govern both? Or, like, like I'm just, like, just the possibilities on how it will work. Like, will the new uh, state uh, have, like, its own stock market, you know? Hmm. Like, I, I, like what, what will their currency be? Will the entire planet use the same currency, or will it split up? Like, will there even be multiple countries on Mars? Like, or will it just be one massive giant country? You know? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question because, frankly, we're gonna have to, you know, unless we blow ourselves to bits, we're gonna have to deal with it you know, coming up in the next fifty years or so. Like, yeah, but so it's just interesting to think about, you know. No, definitely. Uh, how do you think it would uh, result? Uh, I definitely think like they'll have their own thing happening on mars um i feel i strongly feel like it's going to be one nation i don't know if they could separate and survive together i don't really know um i'm also curious and like how they would 
interact with Earth? Like, what if what if they get hostile with Earth? Like, what if they like point nukes at us? You know, what yeah. if they develop nuclear technology? What if they develop technology that's superior to us? You know. Yeah. Well, the the biggest problem with something like that is uh, to even develop, they would be completely reliant on Earth, and it's Mars yeah, isn't yeah, exactly yeah, but, known but, for but, its resources. But eventually, they'll get to a point where they can they'll be self self sufficient. You know. Weird. That's talking thousands of years down the line. I I actually don't think it'll be thousands. Maybe like a couple hundreds, but or even I mean, a couple I'll be, hundred. I'll, I'll be dead by then, by whatever time they're self sufficient. But it's still interesting. Hey, maybe not. It seems like we're making significant progress on the aging problem. Especially with the SpaceX. Well, not aging, but <laughs> personally, I don't even know if I want to be alive that long. I'd rather die young. <laughs> die help. young. I'm not not super young, but I'd rather die when like I I can still like think and operate my limbs as I choose fit, not not be tied down by physical and mental disabilities, you know. So and you would just uh, do a backflip every day in the day that. Up. Not not, not backflip, but like eventually, like when it gets to the point where I'm having trouble just like getting out of bed in the morning, that's then I'm gonna be like, man, this fucking sucks. <laughs> Like, I'm, oh. not, I'm not asking him to run a marathon when I'm 80. Just get out of bed. Also, yeah. I think I think there was some man who ran like like a hundred and two year old who ran a marathon. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Pharaoh Hua Singh. Uh, how old was he? Yeah, hundred and two. Yeah, like what the? In Hong Kong, wow, that's impressive. Well, he's got the beard for it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. God. Isn't there, like, some technique that you have to use if you can't get out of bed, and when you're that old, you just have to, like, do a roll or something? I don't know. All I know <laughs> you is have to get the momentum. No, dude, if a 102-year-old ran a marathon, I'm gonna run a marathon. I've decided. You I'm should. Do it. Your legs might fall off. Yeah, probably, but I'd rather die screaming and kicking than well, that's pretty. That's pretty noble. I, I don't know if I could go along with that. To be honest with you, I would. It, in just the eighty or so years that we get seems so short. And if I, if I just think about, hey, what have I accomplished in sixteen years? I mean, I mean, what would you do at that point? You just have a bunch of free time. I, I feel like I would travel the world, but eventually, once you have traveled the entire world, like, what are you gonna do then? You know, and then. I'm a very adventurous person. Like I like I get bored very easily, so I'd be taking risks. Ah. Master. I I cannot relate to that. I'm I don't I'm not sure I know the meaning of bored, but Oh okay. Yeah. But I, I need I need action and adventure in my life. Yeah. To, to me, on on your point about uh, losing your ability to think, I, it seems like the scientific community right now is making a lot of pro progress on uh, nootropics, which uh, basically the premise behind that is it's uh, uh, it's like uh, multivitamins except for your brain, and they improve your brain function. They they're like the not just the nutrients that it needs, but yeah, uh, specific uh, enzymes and hormones that really improve how your brain functions and. There's a lot of talks with uh, Stephen Hawking about how it has helped him out to really last so long with ALS, and really, if you think of about something like that, that's absolutely incredible. If you look at someone like Lou Gehrig dying after like three years and having like to give an emotional speech in Yankee Stadium, and then the Stephen Hawking guy lasting 55 years, and he's like, "Hey, I'm still going strong. I'm coming on TV, still writing all these papers. I'm doing pretty good." Wait, isn't tropics like food? Uh, like you, uh, you really, it's supplements. Uh, okay. Let me see if I can come up with an example here. Like, no, no, I, I've definitely heard that word before. I think it was like on Shark Tank or something. Oh, mm, I yeah. didn't know Shark Tanks was getting into that. Yeah. Do you watch Shark Tank at all? Uh, sometimes. I literally have nothing else to do. Maybe then. Yeah, here, let me give you a definition here. Uh, nootropics, also known as smart drugs and cognitive enhancers, are drugs, supplements, and other substances that improve cognitive function, particularly executive functions, memory, creativity, motivation, or motivation in healthy individuals. Hmm, that's, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's also not spelled in the way I thought it was. It's actually N O O T R O P I C, not N E U. Hmm. Oh, huh. I, I, I wonder if something like Adderall would be considered a, a nootropic. Like, what are the side effects of Adderall? 
Um, addiction. I, I mean, yeah, but I mean, I mean, there's addictions to sugar, but hmm. it seems like uh, nicotine is actually uh, classified as a uh, nootropic. That's interesting. I mean, for a while, I guess it is. Yeah. Uh, but then, 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 you, you don't actually die because of the nicotine. You die because of the tar. That's what I've heard. Oh, really? Yeah, but still, at the same time, um, nicotine. Yeah, I, I actually don't know how addictive nicotine is. I, I would hope you didn't. <laughs> no. Like, I, I, like, people are always like, oh, wow, it's so addictive. Like, uh, I, don't, I don't think, I feel like it's a mentality thing. No, I think it's actually incredibly addictive, to be honest. Really? With you. I don't know, because I, I know people who have smoked, like, once, and just like, just like a cigar, and they're like, oh, look, I'm fine, like, I'm not addicted. You know, it's your mentality. Well, there's always it, those p some people that just don't get addicted to the thing. It's it's yeah, because it's it's um, it's what you have in your life. I feel like it's a massively mental thing, like because people in um, Vietnam did like soldiers did heroin there. Oh really? And, yeah, but when they came back, they weren't heroin addicts. The huh. reason they did heroin was because they had nothing in their lives, like nothing else to do in their lives except do heroin. But once they got home, they had, like, family and children. So they replaced heroin with family and children in their lives. Oh, you so know, that thing. Drugs, they put their time and energy into something else. So, like, same thing with same thing with nicotine, I would say. It's like, oh, yeah, like, it's there. And, like, but, like, I have a family and I have, like, kids. So I'm going to focus on them rather than doing, like, wasting money on, like, nicotine, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That that's fascinating. I've never heard that story about the heroin. Oh yeah. I yeah. hope that's not a myth or anything. Huh? I hope that's not a myth or anything. Cause that that yeah. seems like the kind of thing they would make up about Vietnam. I, I very much doubt so. Yeah, but it, 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 to me, it seems like it, addiction ha has so much to do with the person's biochemistry at the time, and obviously, biochemistry has both to do with what the person's mindset is at the time, and what they have within themselves and really that's all addiction is it's just working off of what the brain has it in it at the time and i would love to see a place that society could get to where we would be able to have someone take a test on their brain and say hey if you want if you want cigarettes go right ahead you don't have to worry about it or not that like i'm some guy that really wants to have cigarettes but i'm sure there yeah. are some people that would love to try it and just know that they're safe and mm -hmm. really there's so much potential that we have that we can unlock with the brain and it's incredible yeah. how much progress we're making in that area. Mm -hmm. Now, now we're not going to find something that's going to improve the brain function ninety percent. That, that's BS. Yeah, I, I don't exactly know like how much of the brain. Like, I've read like, oh yeah, we use all the brain to like three percent of the brain. I, I don't, I don't really know, man. Yeah, I, I assume it's something like eighty percent. But you know, like all those things that are like, oh, you only use ten percent your of your brain. That's mostly just based on uh, faulty uh, studies that. Either had bad uh, EKG study, no, not EKG. That's has to do with the heart. Uh, uh, what do they call it? MR MRI uh, machines that were uh, focusing on the wrong blood flow and just other things. But really, how much can you gather from blood flow? That just tells you what the brain is focusing on. That doesn't really tell you what specifically the brain. And that doesn't tell you anything about the synapses or the real connections in it. Mm -hmm. yeah, what, what do you think about consciousness? Uh, I don't know, dude. Uh, yeah, I, I don't even want to go there. There's just so much, like, like simulation. Because if you if you say even even if you assume like simulation, like, where do you go from that? You know, like if you say like, oh yeah, we're all living in a simulation. Like, wait, so are the people who are simulating us like? Are they in a simulation? Controlling us? Yeah, are they in a simulation? That's in a simulation. That's in a simulation. Yeah. Like that, that, that one, I just find a pointless question. I mean, if we are, what does it matter? Yeah, yeah what does it matter? We're not going to get out. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. If it is a simulation, it would make a lot of sense. A lot of things would make sense. Because, like, I feel like if you look at universe, like, you know how universe is written basically in math, you know? Oh, yeah. It's very, it's very easy to code math into anything. So if they would, some programmer decided like yeah i'm gonna code this massive simulation using some massive computer you know they, they easily could well why do you why do you think that makes the universe easier to understand 
Uh, what, and what's the problem with the universe just being a logical place? There are just a lot of things that are not understandable. Like what? Um, uh, like gravity. Like why is there gravity, you know? Oh, it's like, gravity because there has to be gravity. Yeah, but like, like why? Like why? Why does? Why does? Why do things just tend to like come together? You know. Well, here, here's how I like to think of it, and, and I, I, this is just my theory I, that you know I think is completely correct. But who knows uh, how the universe actually works? But you know, the way I think of it is, I I treat everything as a iterative uh, cycle, and everything becomes iterative the further you zoom out the creation uh, here let me uh, go down like zoom in really far let's say you're evolution so how does evolution work evolution is just just trial and error over the long term and the beneficial traits went out over time not necessarily the racially superior ones as some people thought in the 20th century but definitely the ones that let lead to a better reproductive success better uh, um, less people committing suicide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's just an iterative process. If you zoom out a little further, you look at world creation, how our world's created. It's just a bunch of clumping particles using their uh, gravity to uh, come together. And but, but where did, where did that gravity come from? Uh, I'll get to that. So they're just clumping together, and eventually it becomes a world, or it doesn't. It might fail, and then the universe moves on. It brings all the stardust to a different place. So you zoom out even further, you look at galaxies, you look at universes, these galaxies and universes, how are they created? Well, we can only judge what we have right now, so we have to say maybe a bunch of galaxies are just created over and over again, and whichever ones happen to be stable, that's the model that the rest of them use, because that's the only model that they can use. But, so you're acting like gravity, like galaxies have like a conscious that they choose. But, and see, and that's, the, that's, that's the big problem with how everyone thinks. They like to humanize things. And like that's that's why I'm able to think about things because I don't humanize things. I look at things as robots. I look at them as okay, these things aren't conscious. People aren't conscious. They're acting in a predictable way that may not be obvious, but if you analyze it enough times, you'll begin to see a pattern. And I believe that's what happens for with the Big Bang. Really, I, I think there were millions of Big Bangs, and over and over, uh, constants were just created randomly. Just because the universe is random, frankly. You get a different value for the gravitational constant, uh, different, yeah, va different yeah. value for the weak force, the strong force, the nuclear force, and... I just feel like someone must have coded it. <laughs> I, I, there, it, it just seems a lot simpler to think about it in that sense. Well, than... of course it's simpler. Yeah. But nobody well, said the universe and, and, is simple. And I, I, don't, I don't think we'll ever, like, at least in, definitely in our lifetime, but even, like, maybe a thousand years down the line, I, I don't know. Maybe one day though, we'll have enough power to maybe like um, harness, like like basically build our own simulation and be like, can we actually build a simulation? Because if humans can build a civil simulation of like people, like basically us in a computer, in like a mass ton of supercomputers, then it's definitely not easy to rule out that we could just be living in a simulation, you know? Oh, yeah, that's definitely true. And that only comes from the more that we can understand ourselves, and that's why it's so important for us to... Like, like have you heard of the Dyson Spear, by any chance? I, I actually have, isn't... Yeah, I, I forget yeah, what the scale yeah. is called for uh, the, like, stage one uh, civilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, of civil stages of civilization and how we're, like, where we are right now, like, 0. 0.73, I think. That's uh, I, I can check. Okay, I think that's what stage we are. But anyways, so, once, like, we get to stage two, I feel like at that point, if we can harness the power of the sun... In the, inside the Dyson sphere, we could have like a row of like supercomputers just computing a simulation on top of our simulation. You know? Oh yeah. Uh, like we we could start our own simulation and just observe the world and see like how like how could this and 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 what's fascinating about that is we could think like certain events happen in world like history that were like programmed by the programmers like um like maybe 
like maybe um who knows um like maybe like jesus christ or mohammed like maybe the programmers programmed them into the simulation so like okay we're gonna start like this new religion how can we do that oh let's make like this holy figure who like does this you know yeah i think that's uh certainly possible so i I would like they like they, they basically affect us in very weird like heck heck maybe maybe the entire election was just rigged by the programmers of our simulation and they're like oh look at these look at these petty little humans like trying to make like democracy work let's just like screw around with these results and blame it on russia and see what happens you know or maybe they're like oh yeah we want like a world war three to happen one like down the line so we're gonna like implement implant this like little like kim jong-il person in in north korea and make him become powerful and then have like a nuclear state in korea Hmm. you know like they could just be messing with us for all we know it's an interesting theorem i I know i know for a fact if i made a simulation i would totally mess around with (laughs) everything i would i would be i would be like purposeful about it you know like maybe like you know how like alien like there's all these like alien stuff like oh who made the pyramids what if like the program is just like oh yeah let's just make a pyramid in egypt and let's see what the immortals do like, where, where did this pyramid come from yeah yeah where did this pyramid come from um and now people are like oh aliens and the programmers are probably sitting there laughing their ass off like oh yeah that's what they think they think aliens did it and we did it yeah, and they, I, could, they could be doing this for like multiple planets. Who knows? Maybe there are like aliens, and they could be running multiple simulations. Who knows? I just know if I ran a simulation, I'd have my face like plastered everywhere so people would think <laughs> I'm the <laughs> god and they'd worship you. Me you yeah. <laughs> this is my simulation. There won't be any doubt. Yeah, it's like it's like someone just annoys me. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna start a uh, plague now because you guys are just annoying me. Hmm. Well, I suppose that'll bring a ra- about the apocalypse. So I, I, I just did about some uh, research on the Kardashev scale, which is what we were talking about with the Dyson Spear, and Carl Sagan uh, estimated that uh, in 1973 there were probably a type uh, 0.7 civilization, most current estimates saying uh, 0.72. And just to give you an idea of the types of civilizations they have on there, type 1 civilization also called a planetary civilization, can use and store all of its energy, which reaches its planet from its star. So that's 100%, which we certainly haven't done. Not doing a great job with that solar energy governments. Uh, type 2 civilization, also called a stellar civilization, can harness the total, total energy of its pl- parent planet's apparent star, with the most popular hypothetical concept being the Dyson Sphere, a device which would encompass the entire star, and transfer its energy to the planet, essentially just like a big metal sphere that's built around the sun. Don't ask me how that would work, but it it would apparently. And a type 3 civilization, also called a galactic civilization, uh, being able to control the energy on the scale of its entire host galaxy. And that that all is uh, mostly popularized by the uh, Russian writer Olaf uh, Stapledon and I'm going to give Wikipedia props there. I don't care if I'm citing Wikipedia. They do a good enough job for me. But it's all a really interesting theory. But I want to go back to the Egypt thing with you, because I think Egypt is a fascinating discussion. Just how do you think they were able to build those pyramids? Alien help. (laughs) You do really think so? Yes, actually, though. Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, I... can't think of a better explanation honestly do you want to hear my theory sure sure okay so my my theory with this is and this is pretty much just borrowed by uh, some controversial historians that i mean you know that i like to read into uh, controversial history because anything that goes against the status quo is controversial you never know what's going to be picked up on and agreed upon currently if you look at something like the jfk assassination most people think that you know, that was probably a conspiracy, and I mean, frankly, I expect that to get overturned at some point to um, it being a rigged thing. I mean, why wouldn't the government want to kill JFK? But that's that's. I, just I, I feel like I feel like it was the mafia. The mafia? Why? Why would the mafia want to kill JFK? He had mafia ties. 
Like, yeah. he, like people have like, but like the Kennedys were really rich. I, I mean, all of the presidents had mafia ties. I mean, yeah, but I feel like I mean, he was a Catholic Italian descent. You know, he de- uh, I feel like he had mafia ties. Don't link it to him to the mafia just because he's Italian. I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. Like, I like okay. Honestly, like search up like Kennedy and mafia ties. Oh, I'll let you search that up, but. Uh, I'm going to get off of that topic before we get too, too controversial with that. But uh, really the biggest uh, thing with the Egypt uh, civilization that I, I think of is... Uh, the, th- the theory behind that is that the entire world has had a... Uh, it has repeated itself in terms of uh, humans developing. Uh, that the current humans that are around today, they're not the humans that have always been here. I mean, there's a lot of theories that the... Uh, uh, what is it? The uh, I uh, you know like obviously we're descended from the Australopithecus, but there there are other uh, types of humans, and uh, beyond that even there's uh, evidence that the some of the uh, great Egyptian structures were actually dug up by the uh, by the Egyptians in the time of the late uh, no no not the late kingdom I believe it was the middle kingdom I think there's one. Uh, one uh, really famous quote by Ramses II where he says, uh, we must uh, dig up the Great Sphinx. And there's some really interesting uh, geological evidence, actually. This is like the only useful thing I've ever seen uh, geologists do, frankly. Uh, sorry, geologists, but, y- you know, you guys don't really do much. But <laughs> but th- there's uh, some really interesting evidence that the some of the wear and tear on the Great Sphinx, it has rain damage. Now, a, a lot of uh, geologists claim that there hasn't been rain in the Nile Valley in at least 20,000 years. So, obviously, How is that possible? Well, there, as I was saying, there's, uh, there's some theories that humans have been uh, cyclical in like, how I was talking about the iterative uh, cycles, that humans die off and then they come back because they're just the natural end course of our of Earth's evolution, and then they die off again from a meteor or something, then they come back, and per- perhaps the Sphinx was built by a uh, perhaps more advanced civilization, not as advanced as today, or we would have seen their stuff, but maybe uh, something as advanced as like Mesopotamian civilization, and they were able to build the Sphinx and our monuments, to, and then they just died off, whether by plague, or by uh, crazy lava flows, or or whatever they happen to be killed from, and I, I think it's a really interesting theory. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you What do you think about um, uh, like Atlantis? Like, do you think Atlantis was a thing? No, absolutely not. I think that's completely off. There's no reason to. You know, I haven't seen any evidence to say that Atlantis was real. Mm-hmm. It seems like that was just some. That's always been a romanticized idea about oh the uh, ocean is so mysterious. Uh, there must be something down there that we don't understand. And then some guy is like tripping on mushrooms or something and sees something coming out of the ocean. He's like, "Oh, Poseidon has returned!" And and uh, like it's it just builds upon from that. But I mean, if you look at the effect that offers can have in a lot of other things, I, is it really unrealistic to say that it was just created? Like, well, just created. That Atlantis was just created? I mean, I think it's possible. I mean, I mean, anything's possible, but, I mean, it just doesn't seem realistic. Yeah, it, it definitely doesn't make sense. And it just doesn't seem necessary, either. Like, there's nothing that I've seen that really says there must be some more intelligent civilization that would, for some reason, want to live under the water. Mm-hmm. Like, that, I the, mean... Maybe they were seeking sanctuary from something. Maybe. Didn't work. Oh, <laughs> yeah, true. What do you think of the human... Div- what do you think of the controversy around the development of humans from uh, Neanderthals to uh, today? Because there's a really uh, controversial uh, point in uh, human development where uh, I-, I believe in, like, uh, I want to say 100,000 years, but it might be 10,000 years, the human brain size doubled twice over, and historians have really no clue why. Aliens. Oh, no, it's not the aliens. It's the aliens. No, why, why are you so set on the aliens? I don't know. 
I think aliens. Are cool. hey, do you do you think it's possible for them to have traveled to us? Yeah, dude. If 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 it's like if they're advanced. Well, sure, but if faster in the life late travel, it doesn't exactly seem like that's possible. It seems like that's just a universal limit. And what if they can travel faster than light, though? Okay, well then we probably would have seen them by now. I mean, if I if I was an alien and I could travel faster than light, then really time wouldn't be a barrier, and you could, frankly, be in as many places as you wanted to at once. It would just time wouldn't be an, a factor for you, and you would just do whatever you want. You would influence as many things as you can for your own kicks, and you know, like it, there's no sense in there being a benevolent uh, alien species. That's not. I mean, competition isn't just an earthly thing. The the world works in competition. The universe works in competition because it it has to. That's how it works. Uh, some some stardust particles just happen to be bigger than others, and they outlast them. And the universe works in random ways. I I personally I think that it's ridiculous to say that there aren't aliens out there, but to say that they're far. It, they are like some crazy advanced uh, species where they're traveling throughout the universe and interacting with us. I, I think that is ridiculous. But the only, the only reason I'm satisfied by that is just because it resolves the Fermi paradox. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah why? why uh, the thing, is, the thing is, if there are so many advanced civilizations, why haven't they contacted us yeah. yet? Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. Just because they can't yet. Yeah, who knows? Like, I, I feel like life happening it's a very like random chance event everything is like think about it. like it took us like two billion years to evolve from like these fledgling things to like us now you know it's very impressive yeah in my opinion it's certain it wasn't uh, one of the original theories that like earth was some crazy volcanic world and then all of a sudden lightning struck the ocean and light life developed from that qualified to tell you. Yeah, I should really ask Miss Johnson, but I think yeah. that was one of the original theories, and then that was uh, rebuted by, uh, I believe, the same person that said that the mitochondria, and not the mitochondria, sorry. But yeah, actually, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts developed far before the nucleus. Actually, did she say that, or was it the other way around? Uh, Lynn Margulis. What'd she say? Uh, that she had like some theory about how uh, eukaryotic cells developed, and it was like a big topic on our uh, last biology test. Not Wait, the, not the you, exam. Did she say that they developed before or after? Oh, she was saying that prokaryotic cells developed long before, but there was a lot of uh, uh, debate about how uh, eukaryotic cells developed and why. And didn't they, didn't they like swallow the mitochondria cells? Or something? Yeah, like some some phagocytosis thing, but. Oh. But uh, it, it's interesting how uh, someone can go from uh, 30 years ago being uh, ridiculed and being considered like the bane of the scientific community to uh, being uh, renowned for getting it right all along. And I can only hope she's still alive to get some credit for it. Yeah, I kind of feel bad for uh, what's her name? Ellen Margulis? What's, no, hold on. Uh, what's her? What's her name? Frank, Frank, uh, Rosalind Franklin. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that was that She terrible. didn't get that credit. Didn't she die from a radiation Yeah, she died. She died. And I don't think she even got... I think she got, like, an honorary Nobel Prize or something, but she never got the actual Nobel Prize. Which is so sad. Yeah, it's a really big shame. Mm -hmm. Especially when, like, some jerk like Watson... Uh, I believe yeah, Bert yeah. Hudson is the one that's still alive now, and he's just publishing all these racist papers on why uh, <laughs> yeah. say why uh, scientific racism is still correct, even a hundred years after it's been routinely disproven. And yeah, it's, yeah, he's just he's a horrible person. Yeah, I feel like there's no Nobel Prize. Uh, how do, what do you think of the Nobel Prize? Do you think it's something that can really be taken seriously? No, not really. It is, it's they usually use to get it off boards, you know? Like, um, what's his name? Like, Barack Obama said it all the time. Like, he, like, just said stuff, and people believed him. And so, he, he, um, 
like like he he just said a bunch of words, you know, and he got it because of that. Even though he at the same time was controlling like a massive like war in Iraq, you know. Yeah, and it was bizarre that he won the Nobel Peace Prize in, was it 2009? And that was yeah. right in the middle of the Iraq War, and right before he just yeah. decided to like, ramp well, it up more. Yeah, give me, I'm going to get the Nobel Peace Prize. Like, it's just dumb. My oh, it's a big shame. Uh, it's interesting how many uh, American presidents have won the Nobel Prize compared to the rest of the world. It's... Especially when America is so war mongering, anyways. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Do you think there's any way the country can save itself from the uh, military industrial industrial complex at this point? No, it's just too big. Well, then what's the what's the end game here? Does the country just collapse? Um, it's too early to tell. I will say that. How uh, do you know how long the uh, Roman Empire? lasted yeah about a thousand years yeah so give it give it a thousand years we saw 700 no. years ago america's yeah. not lasting a thousand years what makes you say that well i mean america's kind of on the downturn right now wait hold up what you looking up longest lasting countries oh yeah well uh, what's your definition for that do they because there's a lot of you could say the Persian Empire but they were always under different rulers you could also yeah I, I don't care about rulers I just want to know duration hmm. okay so there was what the heck apparently there was some empire in India like top two were two empires from India one lasted 1850 years and one lasted 1629 which one was it uh the bandian empire and the chola dynasty well oh, never heard of it wow wow look at that roman empire together with the roman kingdom the roman republic and the byzantine yeah empire. you can't count the byzantines that, yeah, that I, I was not including the byzantines that's way more i i, I count the byzantines. okay well if I you're gonna like count like that it's like another thousand years I, I i still don't understand why they changed the name like it's so dumb uh actually the byzantines lasted from 330 80 yeah to 1453 you know i was just going to wow, like 500 wow. so so the the roman empire technically lasted till the end of like like the beginning of renaissance yeah and that, that was something wow. i mentioned in the last episode that there's a lot of ties between the fall of the roman empire and all of the byzantine knowledge finally being brought to the rest of europe that's amazing i never knew that yeah like i don't know that's pretty amazing. it's 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 the, it's the one good thing the ottomans did during that time Thank goodness I got stopped at uh, Vienna. I imagine a Europe where it's all Muslim. Yeah, I feel like the world would be Muslim at that point, honestly. Yeah, because then right after that, you're just going to get colonialization, and then suddenly the world. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, maybe, would, yeah, who knows. It wouldn't be a bad thing, though. I, I have a lot of respect for the Muslim religion, because yeah, despite all of its uh, militant claims and like its ties to uh, in jihadist uh, pursuit of uh, world domination it has a lot of amazing uh, mor morals that you don't see in any other uh, western religions uh, not even western really because they're all coming from the middle east but like what it, it, well if you look at something like uh, well now i'm not really fit to talk about christianity but in, in the muslim faith there's a huge uh, priority that's put on educating yourself and becoming a cultured person and it's part of the uh, jihadist goal and that's a really honorable thing and when you look at uh, some of the, some of the uh, pursuits that that came with the uh, I forget if it's the University of Baghdad or the University of Tehran but that was the center of the Islamic world for a thousand years and it really is incredible the stuff that came out of that you know, if you look at the caravel and the, they really they created the compass and the they were you know, doing a pretty good job of competing with China during the time, which you don't see with Europe, certainly, but anywhere else in the world. And just to keep up is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I actually, um, like, yeah, like, I think, I think when they blended science and religion, it worked really well. Like, 
Did you know that they invented like algebra or the concept of yeah, algebra while they were Wait. trying to? Uh, I think they were trying to like put you know the what are, what are those actually no called? I'm not I'm not sure about that because there's a lot of debate about who made it was it the Chinese was it the Indians was it the uh, well America? well well they implemented it in like a religious context that's ah. what I was referring to I like see. they were like you know the you know the what are those things that they put up on um. Like, you know, there's, like, a mosque, and there's those pillars right next to it. Uh, the minstrels? Oh, yeah, the minstrels. That might not be right. I'll they, check. They, they, they were trying to put, put, like, those up at an angle that was sufficient, so they came up with, like, algebra. Well, not came up, but they used algebra to solve that. You know, like, when they merged those two, it became really, like, it was good. And I feel like, I feel like Islam, um, until at least you knew what Wahhabism is, Wahhabism. Oh yeah, that's not been a good movement at all. Yeah, I feel like ever since then, Islam has just been going downhill. Honestly. Yeah, it, it, it's a real shame too. It's been the yeah. it's been a real uh, competition between them and the Christians right now, and then the Jewish are like, "Hey, we used to be big." <laughs> no, not really, because oh, minarets, not minstrels. Oh. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, you know, the for some reason the Jewish were always uh, pretty small. Yeah. Which is really interesting because they have very similar ideas between the free faiths, but for some reason the Jewish and the Jewish always got shafted. Yeah, and they always get like minority status, like everywhere they go. I don't understand how or why. Like you really think of them as like lessers. It's just really like you hear all these people like, Oh, the Jews are taking over America. Like what does that mean? You know, actually, I, I, I don't understand that, because I... I, I've, I don't understand that either. No, no, I mean, I've never experienced anti-Semitism in my life. I've never seen it. I Honestly, you know, last year I made a comment to Nathaniel that, uh, wow, World War II was fantastic for the Jews, because even though six million of them died, I thought that anti-Semitism was just gone from the world. Because honestly, I've never seen anti-Semitism in real life. And I get uh, that. Uh, I get that uh, I'm just uh, wrong about that, but... I really, I if not. Yeah, neither have I. It's never like really bad, but um. And of course, we're in America, which is the country that has the most, uh, the highest Jewish population in the world. But other than Israel, actually, does I? I wonder which has more because I don't know how populous Israel is. Who knows? Uh, what do you? Hmm. Yeah, why do you think uh, India didn't develop as quickly as China? Not, not as quickly. Why do you think India wasn't able to v develop as uh, proper, was pro prosperously as uh, China? Because they had very similar uh, starts in terms of uh, history. Uh, I feel like China is just a lot less diverse. And I feel like, like people are always like, oh, diversity is their greatest strength. I feel like that's just complete nonsense. Um, diversity brings with it, like, a, like, not like a unit 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 uh, unified mindset and with the chinese like they have like unity in their like faith in their race in their culture um even for countries like let's say like russia um north korea south korea like they're all like one faith like not one faith but one race one culture one identity like japan and so they have a lot of patriotism the only exception I can think of to that rule is the United States. Um, yeah. But every other like that's diverse country has problems. Like, look, just look at Africa. Like, you got all these different tribes in one nation, always like fighting with each other. You know. Yeah, and, and heck, heck, if you want to tie this uh, podcast back to its beginning, just look at something like the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yeah, like it just fell apart, man. Like Roman Empire fell apart. Empires fall apart. You know. Yeah. Um. Okay. And so I, I think I think when India and Pakistan got partitioned, ever since then there's just been problems. Like I feel like if India and Pakistan were together at this point, uh, India would be like a superpower. Like there, there'd be nothing. Yeah, and if they had Bangladesh too. Yeah, yeah, they had Bangladesh. It it would rival China. It'd probably be stronger than China at that point. It certainly has well, a lot more people. You know, yeah, and. But there was just always problems, you know, between. Yeah, hey, like, at, least like, they, yeah. at least they finally got in the famine under control. Those were terrible. Yeah, but that, that was all caused during the British. <laughs> by the British. <laughs> I was going to ask about that. Uh, how much yeah. of a role you think they played in it? No, I definitely, it's all the British's fault. They got rid of, like, they basically just planted cash crops all across India. 
um, instead of like rice and actual like staple staple foods. Yeah. So uh, just going back to that Jewish thing, I pulled up some of the figures, and apparently, uh, so Israel has uh, by uh, Wikipedia, which you know is not a reliable source, but I will use it anyways, has uh, six point three nine nine million people, and the United States actually, they're not really sure. They it's either a five, it's somewhere in between five point three million and seven million. So the U.S. actually may have more Jews in it than uh, Israel. Yeah, I mean, I feel like America is a much better place to live than Israel, personally speaking. Why do you think that? Uh, mandatory conscription, um, the freedom of not having, just like, like, it's not like, um, there's a lot of censorship in Israel, I know that. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. there's actually. Um, what kind of censorship do they have? Uh, like, I think... So like you can't like you can't really say that much like anti-Israeli stuff. I think huh. I, the news like there's less freedom of speech, less freedom of press. That's a shame. Yeah. Um. What else? It's constantly at war. Like you're living in a very st- you're living in a state that's very hostile. Well, do um, they do they really care? I mean, they're gonna win every time. Yeah, they, they're going to win, but, like, diplomatically, like, if I want to travel to a bunch of countries, Israel is not the country to do it from. Because, like, there are a lot of countries that don't even recognize Israel, you know? Well, I don't, I don't know about that. I think it's surrounding neighbors you certainly don't want to travel uh, to, but no, any there, other... there are countries like North Korea. Like, okay, well, you're not going to North Korea. Hold up. Let me, let me search these up. Yeah, okay. And, and in the meantime, I, I, I just want to say I'm so, The one thing I am proud about with the U.S. is... That they've lasted so long on their uh, uh, claims to diversity. Like if you look at a lot of other, and there's a big movement right now in the world of like a, the majority trying to reclaim their uh, uh, presence in the within the not their presence, the, reclaim the spotlight from the government. And if you look at the rest of the world, countries like uh, Germany and uh, France and like their adult the alt right movements that have been uh, popping up throughout them, and really the figures that you see. The minority popu- populations are only about 10% when these pop up. Of what? Uh, when the these alt-right movements start uh, popping up in the countries. Uh, people like, uh, uh, I forget what her name is in France, uh, Jean Le Pen. Mary Le Pen. Yeah, Marie Le Pen or whatever. And, and luckily she lost, but it only takes 10% in those countries. But in, in the U.S., I believe the minority population is something like 35%. Before we've yeah, been having these problems. It's going to become a minority-majority state. Yeah, definitely. But just think about how incredible that is, that we we were able to survive on three times the mi- amount of minorities in our country. Mm-hmm. Well, that speaks to the character of, and frankly, indoctrination of our uh, government. But, I mean, if it helps, it helps. Yeah, I mean, like, the, uh, uh, about the recent Alabama race, uh, that was one basically off the back, back of blacks. I think like ninety six percent of blacks voted for. Wait, what the, happened with the min- the Alabama race? Uh, it was one off the votes of blacks. Um, Wouldn't like that always be the case? No, like this time they like hardcore pushed it. You know, like I think it, there was a very large uh, black turnout rate oh, okay. at the election this year. Why, why? Why was that? Yeah, I, um, I I just don't follow the news at all. Oh, uh, I I, feel, I I mean, it's 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 what it's you know as Miss Amato was talking like that once a, so a candidate becomes president, there's that like backlash, you know. Yeah. And Trump is just ex- exemplifying that backlash. He's causing the backlash. Like he did, he doesn't realize it, but he is the reason why in four years, like the entire house is going to be Democratic. The Senate is going to be democratic, you know. Well, that's what happens for every president. There's always that countercultural movement. Yeah, but... well, the, the countercultural movement is hard left, like very hard. Like I, I can't think of, I can think of like maybe two people in our school who are like Trump supporters. Really, I can't think of that. Well, by school, do you mean uh, the? Love Hill High School. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's yeah, different, that's obviously. Like... Yeah, because I was I was going to say, if you're thinking of someone like David, he hates Trump. <laughs> Really? Yeah, and it's so funny because like he's always like, "Oh, I hate that guy. He's ruining the Republican Party." 
Oh, is that what he says? Oh, I thought David was a massive Trump supporter. No, he's a massive Republican, but he hates Trump because oh, he thinks oh, he's an okay. idiot. Oh, okay. Well, well, that, but that just leaves like one person left. Yeah. I don't think I should say her name. Yeah, but, no. We, yeah, we're not in the but, business of throwing people under the bus. Yeah, yeah. But, we're in the no, business can, of making money. Yeah, I can just think of one other math side Trump supporter. Other than that, everyone hates Trump. Hmm. Oh, wow. Uh, so I, I finally found a minority report for the U.S. And as of uh, July 2016, uh, white Americans are the racial majority. African Americans are the largest racial minority, amounting to 13% of the population. Uh, Hispanic and Latin, Latino Americans amount to 17.8% of the population, making up the largest ethnic minority. And white, non-Hispanic, or Latino populations only make up 61% of the nation's total. Yeah. And the Latino population is growing massively. Oh, yeah. I mean, it'll slow down. There's only so many more Latinos that can come over. But Yeah. I, I, at this point, like, I think like, more people are actually going to Mexico than people are coming to the United States. Really? Cause like, yeah, because it's like so much cheaper to live there. You know, like I think 88,000 expatriates live in Mexico. Are you sure? I, I, I haven't heard of this at hold all. On, hold on. Because I know there's a, oh, it's just in my uh, American uh, biased perspective, but isn't Mexico still uh, you know, suffering a lot of the con consequences of the drug trade? Like this is this isn't like a Colombia situation where it's past its drug ties. Mexico is still pretty heavily involved in it, and uh, frankly, a kind of dangerous place to live in. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, it, I mean, it depends where you're living. Like, if you live on the border, then yes. I mean, I mean, yeah. If you want to go live in Juarez or something and get gunned down, but. I mean, even I mean, even in places like Mexico City, I think they have a lot of problems with drugs. I mean, I mean, when I was thinking, I was thinking like on the coast, like Yucatan. Oh, okay. Well, at that point, that's barely even Mexico. I mean, what is it then? It's almost part of Central America. Oh, well, then that area. Uh, well, that's a bad point because a lot of areas of Central America actually have horrible drug problems. Like if you look at something like Honduras, you know, like that is. Oh yeah, here's here's a Pew poll. More pe more Mexicans leaving than coming to the U.S. Net loss of one hundred forty thousand from two thousand nine to two thousand fourteen. Family <sighs> reunification top reason for it. Well, that's terrible. What? That they're leaving. I mean, I would leave. I mean, I would too, but we're shunning them. I don't think it's a shun thing. I just think they found better things in Mexico, which is good for them. Like if I if I wanted to eat tacos every day, I would move to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> like that's like I swear like I'm gonna be like when that old guy who like lives in Mexico speaks and the, and the thing is like with me I like actually kind of look Mexican like people like have con like no you don't uh, no people have like actually like mistaken me for Mexican on multiple occasions was that the blind guy that you know no not not even blind guy like people just come up to me and start speaking Spanish expecting me to respond and I'm like uh sorry I don't speak Spanish and uh, one <laughs> I of speak my French friends, though. One of my friends was introducing me to one of her friends, and um, her friend was like, bro, I thought you were Mexican for the longest time. <laughs> like, I didn't think you were actually Indian. And I'm like, wow, that's funny. Really? But yeah, I'm going to be that old guy who lives in Mexico, has like a big house, you know, like goes to the bar every night, talks with the locals in fluent Spanish, like has, has like a maid to clean his house, you know. Why a maid? And lunch. <laughs> Why so do you have to throw in the maid? Anything. Yeah, you're not even able to get out of bed. Why would you clean yeah, your house? Yeah, true, true. I'll just, I'll just go to the bar to drink my sorrows. Just kidding. I'll be so happy if that happens. Gosh, I wonder, I wonder what it is people see in you that makes them think you're Mexican. That's interesting. My skin tone. Hmm, maybe. Who knows? Uh, let's see. Uh, what, what, what country, uh, and so you just mentioned Mexico, but what country right now are you uh, most proud of and would you uh, want to live in if you uh, could right now? Um, can you give me some like guidelines for that? Because there are right. so many countries I want to live in. Well, uh, what, what guidelines would you want? Um, like, it depends on what kind of life I'm living. Oh, okay, so like, are you a rich person, or are you a poor person, or are you... Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's say you're uh, fresh out of college, and you're looking to uh, get started. Uh, like... Well, I'm just 
Wait, so I'm fresh out of college. Yeah, and let's just, pretend, let's just pretend you're in, like, some charter city for the world, and, like, you get to choose whatever country you want to get started, and, like, language isn't a barrier, you just... Language isn't a barrier. Yeah, let's just pretend that you are really good at learning languages or something. <laughs> um, honestly, probably, like, uh, Singapore. Like, I just really, hmm. like... Uh, not not Singapore itself, but its education, its politics, it's just the way it handles diplomacy very well. Um, in addition, it's like in the middle of like the world on that side, at least like the uh, Eastern Hemisphere. So if I want to travel, I can travel like anywhere. Like I can go to India, go to China, Russia, uh, Australia, New Zealand pretty much entirety of Southeast Asia is in my grasp. Yeah, and you're pretty safe from the rest of the world, so uh, politics. Yeah, 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 like, uh, I think Singapore has great diplomacy with everyone. And, um, uh, they, yeah, and, like, even South America, because it's in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, like, South America isn't, wouldn't be that far. Um, yeah, and it seems like they're finally uh, distancing themselves from the drug trade, which is great. Yeah, and it's 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 um also Singapore. So you have a lot of like one like I think the longest flight in the world was from New York to Singapore actually. Oh, I saw and it was like, New York to Thailand, but I mean they're uh, pretty much right next to each other. Yeah, yeah, same thing, same thing. And um, if I wanted to go to LA, I could go from Singapore. If I want to go to London, I can go to Singapore. Like pretty much the entire world is accessible from that spot. So yeah, that's what I would do. Yeah, it's a really interesting choice. Uh, for for me, I'd be uh, stuck between either uh, Germany or uh, oh, what's the other one, uh, Australia, because uh, my problem with Germany is I, I I love everything about the about the country. I love the Germans. I really respect their culture. But my biggest problem with them is they're in Europe. Yeah. And you can't trust Europe. <laughs> you, you just can't yeah. because for some reason Europe's got a big problem where they love to cause conflicts with you in every other country in mm -hmm. Europe. And Plus, I I hate the migrant crisis that's happening. I mean that'll that'll blow over eventually. Uh, Syria uh, will get their. Uh, I really doubt. Well, Syria um, will get their stuff together eventually. ISIS is almost gone. That's amazing. I'm sure. Maybe. I'm sure they'll still, decide I, I to do something with Assad. In my country. Well, I mean, you got to deal with it. I mean, there's they the refugees no, got to go no, somewhere. No. What, are you going to be hungry and just build a wall? I mean, I would just move to Mexico, but that's just me. Like, like I love how people are like, yeah, if Trump becomes president, I'm going to move to Canada. Like, why the hell do you want to move to Canada? Like, it's so cold up there. Like, I'll just go to Mexico. It's like warm, sunny. Yeah, know? And you, I don't know. My problem with Mexico, Mexico is you're still right next to the U.S. And Mexico is kind of America's, uh, you know what? <laughs> like, like, I mean, it, it is. Like, if America wants to screw around with the drug trade, they uh, pick on Mexico. If, uh, if America yeah, they, wants they to... actually, um, the U.S. funded a lot of, like, borders. Like, the, they're fortifying Mexico's southern border. So people from El Salvador, like, Honduras can't get in. Which I think is so smart. Because in, in terms of, like, Latina, like, Latino countries, like, I feel like Mexico is definitely where you want immigrants from. You don't want anyone south of that to come to the u.s because they're just going to be less educated really uh, yeah I, in my opinion yeah i just feel like mexico is much like it has a higher standard than like mm -hmm. the southern latino states yeah it seems like a lot of those are kind of back roads still if you look yeah at some, if you look at something like uh, guatemala it's very uh Run down to Honduras, obviously, if they're uh, falling fish from the sky. Mm. Uh, which I didn't know about. Apparently, they have tornadoes where fish just get picked up and they drop down on people's heads. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. You know, I'll have to read through this education report on the Central American uh, countries, but it, it's, it, it seems like it's just that drug war is just going to be something that we're going to have to outlast. I mean, the U.S. isn't going to do anything about it. That's. I've actually seen some really interesting theories about why we're still in Afghanistan and the ties to the opium market. Because it, I don't know if you know this, but Afghan Af because Afghanistan it has always been the number one uh, country in the world for producing opium. Really, I did not know that. I like I thought it was India. 
Because, like, that's where they, isn't that where the British crew was? Hmm. It, it might have been. Who knows? Alright, guys, we're gonna take a, we're gonna take like a half an hour break so, uh, so that Yash can go eat his, uh, dinner. I would hate for him to go hungry, but don't worry, we'll be back in, I don't know, Yash, how long do you think it takes you to eat? I don't know, dude. I'll, like, we'll see. Alright, I'll say like a half an hour. Alright. All right. All right, I'll pause this.